Today we're here in Fairfield, California with Dr. Gerald Kemp and it's June the 14th, 2012 and welcome Jerry. Thank you so much for participating in the History Makers Project. Thank you for this opportunity, Barbara. This has been a great field for me to work in. Good. Well, why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about um, what you're doing now, where you're living and what you've been up to. Okay, my wife Edith and I live in a retirement, senior retirement community that has been up, run by the by retired military people here. There are, there are two, three apartment buildings and, a, and about 40 homes. So there are about uh, over 300 people living in this area and they provide uh, very good services which include assisted living, nursing care as necessary. We're getting along pretty well yet but those times do come. And uh, I discovered this uh, by reading an advertisement in the uh, Retired Military Offices magazine, monthly magazine. And we wanted something in, in Northern California near Berkeley where my wife's daughter lives. And uh, this was the best and we checked it out, checked some others out, and it does fine. So we're happy to be here. Uh, I'm not involved in education stuff at this time very much. I do have other interests I pursue, and we'll mention those as we go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, your work history, where you began, and, and a little bit about your career. Okay, my work history <clears throat> you know, in, our, in our field, which was known as the audiovisual field, came about after I left the military during the Second World War. I had been a chemistry major at the, at the University of, uh, of uh, Florida, Gainesville, uh, before the war, and uh, I'd studied chemistry there, as I say, and when I came back after the service, I very much wanted to teach. I liked kids very much, and I wanted to teach science to children. And I applied for a, a, a teaching position at a junior high school in Miami, which had a very nice American name known as the Robert E. Lee Junior High School. <laughs> I use films a great deal because I love the idea of not just talking. As, as I had teachers would say to me once in a while, that it, like, I, I remember a uh, history teacher uh, teaching a course uh, to the students on, on the, uh, the, the revolutionary days. Uh, as, as America was forming, and I said, hey, there's a new film in the library on the, on the revolution. Oh, she says, that sounds interesting. She says, well, as soon as I get done my lecture, I'll consider using it. And I said to myself, wouldn't it be good for her to use that before the lecture so the students would know more what this subject is about rather than go through the verbal work that she's doing in her lecture? And that way, and I became more interested in helping teachers to look at the contributions that audiovisual made. So that's where I got started. Uh, I tried. I took my master's degree at the University of Miami in Florida, and uh, there was one course on audiovisual education, and it was a course that was mainly uh, offered by the salesmen from the film projectors and slide projector companies for the students there. And I learned how to run the projectors in that way. But also the interesting thing was that there was a textbook used in the course. And it was a book some of you may have be familiar with from a long distance. It was done in, in the 1940s, 46. It's Edgar Dale, Audiovisual Methods of Teaching. And this is really a fascinating thing to read, even today, to, to look at this. Uh, I marked one page in here, which is, which is what's called the cone of experience. Mo moving from the most communicative forms of technology, down at the bottom, direct purposeful experiences, contrived experience. Dramatic participation, where you're all doing things. 
demonstrations, field trips, exhibits. And then those are the doing. And then on the second level are the observing. And these are with motion pictures, radio and recordings. Remember, this was written in 1946. Visual symbols. And then there's the top of it, which is the symbolizing, the verbal symbols, the, the voice, and so forth. So we're going from direct experiences to the media, which an intermediate type experience, to the verbal levels dealing in lectures and so forth. And, and Edgar Dale just did a great thing, and he was at Ohio State, and I admired him uh, for many ways and kept in touch with him later on because he made me think about this field in new, in new ways. So that's how I got started in the profession. That's wonderful. And um, tell us about the primary focus of your work during your career. Well, I, when, I, when I started working in the audiovisual field, it interested me greatly because it was learning some things that you could participate in. It wasn't uh, a, a textbook, particularly verbal learning, the top of the, of the Dale Cone, in that sense at all. It was hands-on in a large extent. And I had experiences as a, as a young kid going to a boys' summer camp in Connecticut. And it was fascinating to me because the director was just, just a, a very good teacher, but his teaching was that you, the student, had to be able to do it or, or discuss it or understand it and illustrate that. And we would do things about learning about plants and the different leaves on trees and things. And we would have to identify and relate them ourselves rather than just hearing about them. And that started me out thinking about if you're in education, you would want the student to be a participatory resource in the process of learning rather than sitting back and verbalizing about it, which is how it so often happens. So the audiovisual field for me was the way to get out into that. And, and that got me going. When I finished my degree at the University of Miami, the, the um, uh, master's degree, and I still had GI Bill left, I, I talked to the audiovisual director at the, at the uh, film library in the county, and I said, you know, where, where can you go to get a doctorate degree? I still have GI Bill, so I wouldn't have to be paying for my education. And I would like to study somewhere where I would learn the practical things dealing with audiovisual. He says, the best one in the country is Indiana University. I said, in Indiana? Yeah. I said, oh, that's interesting. And I contacted them, and I found out that they teach you how to film production, how to do slide and record with, uh, with tapes, and you can make little strips, which we call film strips, and put sound on them, and those can be used for students to study by themselves. And I said, this sounds fascinating, it's practical. I was also learning about running film libraries and, 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 and the theories of, of communication and all that you need to learn on the doctoral level. So I went to Indiana University, and I was there about two years working on my, on my doctoral degree, and I learned w wonderful things from a faculty and a staff that, that were most remarkable. Uh, I wrote down on paper here some of the, some of the, uh, the people, oh boy, I didn't have that guy's name down that ran the show, but there was a fellow in, in production, Harvey Fry who taught graphics and all. And there was a fellow named Denny Pett who taught motion picture techniques. And it was awfully, you, you really got to do it and became so good at it that, that you'd be able to, to work with it as you did it. And that got me into the field that way very much. And after I finished my work in Indiana, the interest now uh, was to find a job I could work in in applied this stuff, and I was told that at a place called, and it was actually San Jose College in the late 50s, 
which was in California, in the Bay Area, relatively near San Francisco. And they were setting up an audiovisual center with a film library and so forth, primarily for resources for the faculty. And they did have uh, what we now, what we used to call, and they still do, except they're retired, uh, overhead projectors and opaque projectors that faculty members could use in their teaching to illustrate things. And the audiovisual center, in addition to having the film library, had staff members who could help the the faculty members to use this stuff and also produce it. We, I, had a, we had, I had a film product man that worked with me in film production. I had a graphic artist. Uh, I had a, a recording ma uh, uh, technician. And these all could work with faculty and me. And I, I was doing scripts and doing storyboards for faculty on things they wanted to illustrate. And that was a great come on and it got th things very interested. And faculty members became very active with this and it satisfied me, excuse me, because I could see things that they would want to do. I still remember a, an instructor in the uh, art, hist art department who taught art history. And this was general education. So she had students that came to art history who came from business and engineering and the sciences, history, language, and they, they'd have to take a, 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 a general education class and they picked the one in art history. And she said they would sit in, a, and she had about 60 of them in a lecture hall, and she would show slides and lecture about historical topics. And, and, and she could see they were bored by this sort of thing to do. And, and as she said, at the end of the course, when they took the final exam, and they were leaving, one guy would say to another one as he left the, through the doorway, he'd say, boy, that's the last art class I ever take. He says, that was just boring. She says, I want to make it more interesting. I said, well, can't we get them to learn some of this stuff on their own by having the visuals you show and talk about and ask them questions that would get them involved and then instead of your lecturing, they could study this stuff in a layout with film strips or slide tape or whatever we could provide and you and I could script those together and then you would present and they would have time and we could set up a lab where we'd have this whole series of film strips set up and it would be open, we could get graduate students in art who could, who could run it there for you and, and then, then you would meet them three times a week for your three hours of classes and have them meet with you and discuss these things and review questions before your tests and all. And I said, you might even be able to take field trips to museums and art galleries that they could see the, the artists and what you're talking about. And she was very open to this sort of thing. And that became a, a big deal. And that got me started on thinking about teaching in new ways with the media and all sort of thing. So that, that, that worked with me at, at, at San Jose State. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, the word got out with her and I had a fellow in science doing this also uh, with his labs and so forth and, 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 and work, have the students study this stuff ahead of time and prepare to meet in, in the class with the instructor and go over reviews and so forth. And uh, we even had people from the chancellor's office saying, what are these people doing there that's so different? We get here, and I used to go down into the lab of the, uh, of the, of the art teacher and in, into the, into the, where, the, where the students were studying by themselves. And there used to be people coming in and looking around. And the, and the graduate student who was from would ask, excuse me, uh, you're not in the class, are you? No. He says, but I took the course last semester. And I wanted to see what you're doing different now. So it's just a whole series of beliefs in that. And professionally, that got me starting to think more and more about uh, the need for getting us to use the audiovisuals not as assistance for the lecture, but for student learning that they can pace themselves on at their own time and then move on to it. So 
that was my background, so to speak, as I moved into this sort of thing. I was having contacts with other leaders in the field, and, and I, and I can, can mention uh, some of them. Pardon me for putting my head down for a moment. I wanted to get a book up out here. Uh, for example, a fellow named Jim Finn, James Finn at USC, did a book on extending education through technology, which my, my colleague at San Jose State, Ron Macbeth, uh, was the, the, was the pu publisher, the, or the, he was sort of the uh, uh, editor. He was edited by, but this was, this was James, Jim Finn was a very good theorist in the field. Uh, he didn't ever make audiovisuals himself, never made a film or anything, but he did the theory behind it and what it meant. And I would read that and others would read it and we'd feel this sort of thing is so, so valuable. And I'll, I'll mention some others that were very important here. I mentioned Edgar Dale, Jim Finn, fellow at, at uh, Penn, Penn State, Charlie Hoban, there. There was a fellow in, uh, and, in, and by the way, as a side issue, when I went to San Jose in 1958, uh, what was happening in the early 60s, many of you now know about, the Silicon Valley was being started in that area. And there were a great number of companies that were forming to deal with computers, Apple, Intel, Hewlett Packard, and go on and on. And they were running into interesting problems. They were teaching, they had to, they had to provide instruction for their employees. And the engineers were developing the components of computers that were necessary to develop here. And that was going to cause training for the uh, people who assembled, the, made the equipment, put it together, those who sold uh, salesmen out in the field, and many others in the company to understand what the computers are and what they would be doing and how they should be put, manufactured and so forth. And they were lectured to by engineers. And as, as one of the companies, uh, Hewlett Packard, uh, gave us a call one day and said, and said uh, Dr. Kemp, uh, we have a problem. We have engineers giving lectures to our employees so they understand what they have to do in their operational footworks or in the sales work. And, and the, the, the employees tell us that they don't understand what the engineers are talking about because they're giving them lectures. And as one said to him, the, the manager said, we're giving, uh, it sounds like one engineer lecturing to another engineer and they're not communicating to average people. So we took the engineers and we gave them courses where they would make visual materials, they could make videos if necessary, or 16 millimeter in the early days, and slides, and use these along with handouts for the employees, and they describe them, and the staff started to learn the stuff. And they thanked us profusely. And I said, you know, we only, only have to train our teachers and professors, but we've got to help the engineering and the, and the manufacturing companies to understand in training there, audiovisual has a key role to play. So I had people, uh, some of you may remember the name, um, Robert Mager. Bob Mager did a, did a very nice book, and he, he, he remembers something called Program Instruction that went on in the early days, which, which was pages in a book, <laughs> which, were, which were just questions with some information, and you have to pick an answer to the question and go to another page. Either, either a right, yes I would, no I wouldn't, and you pick the right page and it'd say, oh no, you're wrong. You, you have to learn more about that, go back and read it again or something, or yes you did, if so now turn to page 37. So you go all over the place, and, you, and, and publishers were very upset because you're only writing a little bit on a piece of paper when you're doing the book. But Mager did a book on preparing objectives for program instruction. And he started to teach me about things that I wasn't thinking about initially here. So there were a lot of people in industry. Robert Gagné at Florida State was into the theory. 
for some of these sorts of things. Um, there, uh, uh, Roger Kaufman at uh, Florida State also, I think, was in that. Dave Merrill, who was in our field. Ivor Davies. I have a number of people that are listed down here. B.F. Skinner, uh, I, I mentioned also. They were into this sort of thing in new ways. Now, what this did to me was to think of doing beyond what we were originally doing. And what I, what I was doing was dealing with the audiovisual material stuff. And I have then said, I'm going to make some textbooks about this that people will understand. And I first started my textbooks, what year was that? 63. Planning and producing audiovisual materials. I had a graphic artist that went a photographer that worked with me. And you can just see on pages there are photographs and art things trying to tell people. When you talk about a camera shooting a long shot through the lens, what does that mean? Well, you can see what different, you can have a long shot, medium shot, close up, and so forth. And it's all explained in the book. And this was a great book because I ended up with about eight editions. And there was a fellow from Utah State University, I'll get it right, uh, Don Smiley, who became a co-author with me, because I wasn't up on some of the new technologies anymore now. And we did great on that. Uh, we made a thing for Toastmasters, people who give talks and so, and it's, it's great if they would use audiovisual. Toastmasters International had an audiovisual handbook that a colleague of mine at San Jose State, Dick Lewis, Richard Lewis, did. We did it together with, it, with an artist, and he illustrated how things could be explained very nicely. I noticed at the very beginning they had a great, a great deal of people seated, sleeping with, <laughs> in lecture halls and all. Uh, you know, it wasn't working. And then it, it was so interesting that we prepared a guide for educational media uh, from McGraw-Hill which talked about what these media are and how they are. Uh, and then we did a kit. We produced a whole series of visual materials that could be used by teachers to learn more about this. And th this was our contribution and the pro productivity of this and got our name into many people. Uh, and, and then when I was doing all this, uh, I became president of it. Should I continue? continue? Absolutely. I became president of ADCT in 1973, and guess what year that was? That was the 50th anniversary of ADCT and, and, and uh, DAVI, its forerunner, which started in 1923, and now it was 73, our 50 years in AV. It was, we did a commemorative booklet on, on this sort of thing. And, uh, and I, was, uh, I was president, and Bob Jarecki was the president-elect from Sacramento. <clears throat> Howard Hitchens was executive director. And uh, Dick Nybeck was a deputy executive. These are going back to the 70s. Uh, there's a copy of this around. I know an ACT put this out of how it worked and all that, and it's, it was fascinating, uh, all, all the folks that uh, talked with us. Uh, I can mention names like Charlie Shaw from Michigan State, uh, Ray Wyman from Central Washington, and, uh, and, and all those. My colleague, Ron Macbeth, Phil Lewis, he was uh, president of a company in Chicago, uh, and, and so forth. Here was Jim, here was, uh, 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 I know Jim's name, Jim Finn <laughs> here, and Donald Ely from Syracuse. So these were all people participating, and we were getting well known. And as this, as this moved on, my feelings started to change in the field also. I said, you know, it isn't just audiovisual that's important when we talk of technology. And I was learning from the people in industries in Silicon Valley that the term technology is a process, not just a how to do it. 
And I started to think about are there ways we can do things that a, a, a company that is, you know, inventing something is to helping to design. And I think today ab about the space vehicles and, and all the advanced stuff that they're dealing with has got a lot of elements of technology to put together. And how may this apply? And Jim, F Jim Finn talked about this theoretically, and not getting to the guts of it. And what happened was, I said, you know, it, it deals with planning. And I, our, our, how you plan instruction. So if you're going to make a film, there should be some objectives that relate to what the film is going to be doing. And then how that fits into the subject area. Science teacher, and you're going to make a film about uh, birds and, and, and how they're able to fly and so forth. You want to say, now, wh what do you want the students to learn about that? So I said, there ought to be someone I call, I, made, I came up with the word instructional design. And this was in 19, 1971. My first book entitled Instructional Design. A plan for unit and course development, and the and the format I had was very. Uh, I had my bl blinkers on pretty much. It it had a whole series of steps. I started from you pick the topic and general purpose you want to deal with. You look at the students as to their characteristics, which means which means their preparation for it. What are the objectives you want to teach? What is the subject content for the objectives? A pretest to give, so the students would test, the teacher would test the students, and the students would say, see, I know all that stuff. Why do I have to study it? Or, these are the parts I don't know, and I need to now study that and fit them in. And then, what we call the teaching, learning activities and resources, and you think about what the teacher can present, what the student can learn by him or herself, and what projects the students can have in, in activities, problem solving, applications, and so forth. And I call that teaching learning activities and resources, and the resources you need with it. What films, what, what places in the community, and so on, and then evaluation. And it was a linear list you come down, and then if this isn't right, you keep coming back. And I did that in what I called the instructional design process in those days. And as I worked with this, I, I came across a, 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 a person who was very thoughtful, a Canadian. The name was Marshall McLuhan, who came from Canada into the field of media. And he, he had a a statement he made many times in presentations at our national convention and elsewhere and he said we move into the future looking in a rear view mirror and people have to think a moment what do you see when you look in a rear view mirror what I do, what I where I've been what I've done before so old habits don't change easily and people who are used to giving lectures as professors are, changing them is quite different. I, I, uh, I, I ran across an article uh, from a recent paper, and you folks, I believe many of you have possibly heard, heard, heard this. The fellow named Saul Kham, K-H-A-N, who he has, has, quote, has a labor of love is sparking a revolution in online education. And he was in my San Jose area, at Mountain View, and he so forth. Uh, uh, he is dealing primarily with, with students taking online courses, most of which are set up for self-paced learning on their own. And, and then uh, uh, and, and, and it being done by technology, and he has 100,000 students around the world taking this and getting, getting credits for it too. 
It's debatable some of the things he does. I, I, I wonder whether it's lecture and looking at, at videos and filling out a form and so forth. And interestingly, when I started teaching my instructional design class at San Jose State, the students, it was a graduate course in our, in our instructional technology master's program, and uh, we, would, we would meet from 7 to 10 on Monday nights for 15 weeks in the semester. And the first night we got together, uh, the students all came in and they got notebooks out and we to write stuff that the professor tells them. And I told them, I said, now, this is the textbook we're going to use, and it's, it's in the bookstore for you to get, and we're going to spend the first uh, five weeks of the semester, or six weeks of, of the semester, studying the textbook. And we're not going to meet in class at all then. What? What kind of a course is that? I said, well, you've got a responsibility, students. And this could be 20 students. And maybe a third of them are people, training people from industry, who are taking the master's program there. And I said, your job in five weeks is to study the first ten chapters in the book, which are explaining what the instructional design process is, how it works, what the elements are, and how you can apply it. And you are to go through the book, and there are, at the end of each chapter, there are a whole series of review questions. Uh, and I said, and, and, there are just questions there. Now, with each, with each, for each of you, I'm going to give you a set of six or eight, I can't remember, six I think, uh, six or eight audio cassettes, which are audio guides for you for those chapters you're real dealing with. You should listen to each chapter, start listening to the beginning tape on that chapter before you read the chapter, then it tells you to read certain pages in that chapter from the first pages to the, to the first 10 or 12 of the 20 pages and then do the review questions and then come back to the tape. What you, what's going to happen? I'm going to give you feedback on the review questions and you can check your answers. If you weren't right, review for yourself. Check the questions again and then check the answers. See if it comes out better. And you will have five weeks to do this. And I will be here in the classroom all of those five weeks from 7 to 10. And if you can't make it, if you're working and so forth, call me and we'll set an appointment up sometime to come to my office and work. And you've got to do that. And then guess what? You're going to take an exam from me on those 10 chapters. And you know what? You've got to get 90% on the exam to pass. And some students would say, I never get 90% of the exam. I said, well, I said, well, give it a try. And if you go through the review questions and they're not coming out right, do come in and visit with me and let's talk about it. And we started this, and I said, now, after the five weeks, we're all going to meet again. And I'm hopefully that 90% of you have got the 90% grade on it. Some of you are going to be are going to be dropouts. I know you're not going to all enjoy this. I don't want that pressure and so forth. But give it a good try and let's go on. Then we're going to apply this. You're going to become a, a resource. A subject. You're going to pick a subject that's important to you, that you know about. And you're going to work with one of your colleagues here and do the instructional design process to develop instruction for that topic. So you're the subject expert now, and the other f person is the instructional designer. And show us how it works, and then you come back in and together, and we present these to class and discuss and go on. And realize you're not just giving lectures. You're dealing with self-paced learning by students and interactive activities among students and instructors and so forth. So go to work. And it worked fine. And the students used to come in and tell me, this is wonderful. I can get this. And I can study this myself at my pace. And I can review it. And if I have questions, I can ask you or ask another student who would help me. And it went on like this just fine. And someone would say to me, which I kept smiling when they said this, they said, you know, in my instruction that I'm giving in courses, 
I would like to use this approach, where I could have a reference guide here, a textbook, I don't want to call it a textbook, and have them study this and review, and then work on it, and then we would help them, and they would get it, because, you know, you deal with people that are in the manufacturing or so, and you don't want them to be 80% answering the question, you want to be 100%. So people would start doing this more, and it, it caught on more and more. And that's where we got out to, to do it more. That's a terrific overview of, of uh, your contributions to the field, Jerry, and a real treasure trove of, of publications you've assembled there. And um, so you really helped initiate the, the whole concept of instructional design. I, I hope so. Now, there were people that were doing it. I told you, Jim Finn, mm -hmm. he, he wrote about it. But he always gave lectures. Jim never went into the technology in an application sort of way. But we like to hear from mm -hmm. him. But the, the, the fellows who picked it up and applied it at Florida State, uh, did I mention Roger Kaufman? He was a name I had on my list who applied this stuff so well in, 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 in his way, his way there too. So uh, they, yes. Uh, they picked it up for me, and I'm just pleased to see it move, keep, keep moving around like that. And so, um, what do you think was the greatest accomplishment of your career, and why? Well, it's really that instructional design to the instructional design process that, that, that picked up and came about, and, and people saw the way to apply it, and they were able to use the, the Marshall, not use his, but understand that you don't look in a rearview mirror when you're teaching, you look in the future. Uh, it, it, the world has changed. And right now, you know, I feel like the guy that, that used to run something and ran it, and other people took over and, and, and have advanced it, and all and the guy keeps running up and saying, wait, wait, I'm your leader, wait for me. <laughs> and that's where I am now. When I, when I th think about that, uh, that con guy who's, who's, who's got his... Uh, his stuff now on, online. I'd like to look at some of his courses and see how they run. And are we, are we, is this a guy that ought to talk at the convention that we're having, I would think, and talk about his approach to it? Because that's where the world's going. I mean, it's coming to the point where, where, where schools are not going to be needed, period. We've said that before, way many years ago. But it, it isn't happening. But now it's happening with online and opening it up in all sorts of ways. So. Uh, I, I feel I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm lucky to be an, an early leader, and there are many others, but uh, from here on, it's, uh, it, it's, it's stand back and get out of the way and let the world change. And it's going to change more and more in, 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 in our business. Well, speaking of online education and future trends, what do you think um, future professionals could learn from a look in the rearview mirror? at the history of some of the, the trends and issues that you've discussed. Yeah, I think, and I, and I think I'm just, I'm just a piece of that process. Uh, see, I have to say, say this, when we, when, we, when we got started with this, and I have to say uh, Charlie Regaluf, another one, some of the Indiana folks and others uh, that came about, and Charlie and I worked together, uh, in my experience, I, I applied this stuff, this is what I was doing, and a lot of my colleagues, I found out, were on the talking level about it. And I don't know, I, I asked Charlie, he's just kiddingly, Charlie, do you teach all in lectures in your class? Well, we had discussions too, you know, but he doesn't say anything about technology in, in what's happening. So I don't know where folks are going in the future that way, because we had set up the the, uh, uh, the the division of systemic systemic change in, in in the field and all, but I don't hear much of that happening that way. Uh, people are applying things, but I don't and I don't see and I, again I'm out of I'm out of circulation pretty much. But what impact is AECT having on other national and international organizations in what we do and the, and, it, and from a research standpoint, they are, because AECT's emphasis in so many ways is on graduate students and their research. When I read Tech Trends, it's really 
graduate student articles dealing with their dissertation on what they've been doing and, and how it can affect education and so. But I want to see, I want to see the, the, the real stories of how we have affected it, uh, where we have impact on the uh, Department of Education. You know, the no child left behind concept, which doesn't deal with what we're, we're dealing with, with here at all. Uh, they don't think of, of uh, it, it's, it's, it's the rear view mirror stuff. It's the same old practices, but you've got to speak louder to them or run faster. And it isn't, it isn't doing it. And I, I don't have enough knowledge about some of the technologies now to be able to help people, but I, I haven't been asked to, to, to meet with any and, and throw out questions that, that could stimulate some rethinking where we should be part of the, uh, the changes in technology and, and the changing impacts of technology within this. It, you, you listen to uh, an interview on, on the news hour on PBS by uh, education, uh, uh, what's his name, in, in the Department of Education, can't think of it, that runs things. And what he discusses is never everything dealing with this kind of media change and, and how, how it can change away from the teacher in control to where the students control much of their learning and the teacher performs another function. We don't hear that in, in, in the education involvement here. And, you know, it, there was an AC, AECT convention uh, before, during, or after mine in which we tried to take the conventions away from, from, from lecture presentations at the convention. To have some uh, uh, video that set up that, that's, that the attendees could review before the presentation was scheduled. And they would get the message that the presenter has to offer. And then the presenter's job was to form small groups of discussion and then come back, present their summaries on his topic or so, and let him talk about how effective and so forth. We tried that. We tried that in California a couple of times with, with film strips that people would look at uh, beforehand, sound film strips, and, and, and see how that would affect uh, the changes in the, in, in the, in, in, in the uh, programs. And there was interest shown, but not much pickup after whoever was running in charge, the convention director, would, would do this and the next time the guy didn't care about doing it, or he or she, and all. And I, I still say we're, we're still in some of those areas. Jerry, that was a fantastic overview of, uh, you. of your career path and your um, amazing contributions to our field. Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing recently. Well, as you get older, you've got to think more about what's going to happen with your life and what you need to do if you're interested in keeping it going. And uh, uh, as I said earlier, I, I, I've been thinking about well living for, for many years and there are three components of, of healthy living. One is exercise, which we tell people you've got to do, not just sit and watch television. Uh, secondly, you've got to eat properly, good nutrition. And third, you've got to keep an active mind, which is, is, is helping you keep away from Alzheimer's and that sort of stuff. One last question. Yeah. How would you like to be remembered within the profession of instructional design and technology? I can only say you have to look at my, my, my publications and those that are of the later dates dealing from, uh, when I say the later dates because I retired in 88, so dealing with the 70s and 80s, uh, those that seem to apply and that, that our people in the field can see efforts to include in the new technology uh, theory as well as the operations would feel that I've contributed something to them at that, at that 
for the, with, with those resources that can still be applied today, I feel. Thank you so much, Terry. Our pleasure to be with you.